In 100 years, it has killed more than 4,000 prisoners. More than any other means of execution, it has become the terrible symbol of America's death penalty. This is the story of the first ever electric chair killing and the extraordinary battle between two of America's industrial giants which led up to it. It was one of the first attempts to kind of use a scientific knowledge and apply it to the science of killing. But I think that the story behind it is really the attempt of one major electric company, Edison, to discredit another major electric company, Westinghouse. Here we have two people, Thomas Edison and George Westinghouse, who are such pioneers and such important people in the, in the industry. Both of them are, are really uh, immense people. And here they're getting involved in something like the execution of a criminal and fighting over it, something like that. I think electricity was mysterious to almost everybody in the world in the 1880s and 1890s. It was a mysterious force that was dangerous. It could electrocute you. It was lightning. It came out of the skies almost like an act of God. It was invisible. It was immensely powerful. And I think it was this incredible sense of mystery that people approached this new servant as it was seen at the time. Electricity had a strange dual nature in the popular imagination. On one hand, it was a dealer of death. People were dying accidentally from touching streetcar wires. But also, electricity was perceived as, to a certain degree, as a giver of life. There were uh, electric insoles for shoes. There were electrical belts, electrical uh, galvanic belts to restore men's virility. Um, electricity was perceived as having a nearly supernatural quality. There was this whole idea that electricity represented progress, that this was the new world. And there was a feeling that if electricity was going to make life better, it could make death more painless. Or well, so they thought. In 1880, America was on the cusp of an electrical revolution. Horsepower and steam power had built cities which teemed with life during the day but were dark and brutal when night fell. Electric light transformed the cities. It rolled back darkness with soft and constant illumination. It seemed miraculous and made a hero of its inventor, Thomas Edison. The filament of the first practical incandescent lamp which I invented was a carbonized cotton thread. In the search for a better filament, I carbonized everything like me. Edison really personified the American genius, the entrepreneurial spirit, and I think he still does that today. You know, I think in American history, he's probably the symbol of the kind of individual entrepreneur, the genius, tinkering, uh, coming up with useful inventions. Edison's laboratory was a factory of invention. His phonograph preserved the voices of the dead. His motion picture camera made them live again. To Americans, Edison was an alchemist of sound, vision, and light. He was a magician who transformed life and death. It's hard to think of a hero nowadays that is something like that. Uh, maybe back when we had the astronauts first going up into space that the people admired them so much in, in, that, in that aspect. But Edison was really considered the, the oracle of electricity. If Edison said so, then it was true. Edison brought electricity into the lives and homes of America. In 1882, he completed his most ambitious scheme to electrify Manhattan and flood Wall Street with light. The whole aspect of Edison that I think he played upon in that particular invention was very godlike, 
fiat looks, you know, I am going to throw the switch and there's going to be this magical instant when there will be illumination. And the press just was all over that. It was sensational. Sensational. Edison's triumph was a beacon to other industrialists. He had created a new market as vast as America. To competitors, it was irresistible. And in Pittsburgh, the giant Westinghouse industrial empire began to investigate the market for electricity. In 1882, George Westinghouse was at the peak of his powers. He had made his fortune in railway equipment. He saw his future in electricity. He set out to challenge Edison's electrical dominance, combining ingenuity with industrial might. During Westinghouse's lifetime, he started 60 companies, but he had 50,000 employees, which was by far the biggest employment workforce of anyone up until that time. He was one of the first visitors to come and admire the Edison system. But it's in the nature of any industrialist and inventor to basically, number one, find out what other people are doing, but then next, how can I do it better? Edison used direct current. Rotating magnets generated the electricity, but the fluctuations were evened out to produce a one-way current. The system worked best at low voltages with short transmission runs. Edison's vision was of a DC generating station on every street corner in built-up areas. He believed in what direct current stood for, that it was over a shorter distance, that it was a way to keep connected with the consumer, that it was a way to keep control over, the, over electricity as a commodity. Edison may have been first, but as a system, direct current was vulnerable to Westinghouse. Direct current uh, had its limitations. Couldn't be transported over great distances. Uh, you needed very large copper wires to do that. So you have a copper wire. To go a mile, you need a copper wire the size of a man's leg. Westinghouse pioneered a system which could travel over thin and cheap copper wires. It also used revolving magnets, but used the rapid fluctuation in polarity to create an alternating current. He built transformers which wound the current up to high voltage, making it lethal. But Westinghouse's system had positive advantages over direct current, and he invested massively in AC. George Westinghouse was a brilliant inventor. He very quickly grasped the significance that with alternating current, you could transmit the power over a very long distance. And so you didn't have to have a power station in everybody's backyard, as you did with direct current. Edison's system was crippled by its generating and distribution costs. The thick copper cabling it needed made it uneconomic, and the direct current system began to falter. Westinghouse, the admirer of Edison, was increasingly confident of the superiority of his own system. Westinghouse started to cut into the business and became a very serious competitor. And even after just two years, he was outselling Edison in new installations. A lot of Edison's agents or salesmen began to uh, defect to Westinghouse. A lot of them called for acceptance of the alternating current system. But uh, Edison would have no part of it. I think he probably felt that, look, look, I invented this industry. It's my genius that's behind it. And now this other guy's taking it over. And it didn't sit too well. <laughs> when you have another rival for a different type of transmission of electricity, then you've got the seeds for conflict. It's beyond technology. By that time, you had the money and the stamina and the ego to outrun anybody else. It was a question of who was going to remain standing at the end of the day, who was going to remain standing. It's a very ego-based thing. Edison, the electrical pioneer, was challenged and affronted. His will was total, and a contest was underway which would see electricity put to its darkest use. Of 
1880 to 1890, we started having electrical systems all over the country. I sometimes liken it like when the TV burst into this country, that we didn't have TV by the 1950, by 1960, everybody had TV. The same thing happened with the electrical systems. In 1880, there was hardly anything. By 1890, there was all over the country. Now with the electrical systems available, people start touching it, getting electrocuted, and then they started understanding something about the fact that electricity is dangerous. One of the questions that came up and one of the big advantages of DC direct current was that it was safer. It traveled at lower voltages and was perceived as not being as deadly. When Edison began to kind of lose the marketing war with Westinghouse, he started to look at and focus on his main advantage, and that was safety. Edison seized upon the new battleground and his organization started to pump out stories, trumpeting the lethality of high voltage alternating current. Edison was fighting back, associating Westinghouse's AC current with the fear and mystery of death by electrocution. They had no concept at all of electrocution. Some thought it might be its effect on the brain, on the spinal column, they just had no idea they uh, have cases like in Buffalo, New York, where the uh, man went into a uh, generating station when he was drunk, and he put his fingers across the generator and got a shock, and he died relatively quickly. And I thought, gee, isn't that a nice way to kill criminals? Because look how quickly the man died. The legislators, too, noted the rash of electrical deaths. For years, New York State's governor had been seeking a new and more humane means of execution. The governor had decided to set up a commission that would survey and study all various methods of execution used throughout the world. And they would try to assess them in terms of their scientific and medical viability. Basically, they're looking for something that was quick and painless and that didn't mutilate the body. Historically, New York State had hanged its murderers. Now a death commission was to seek a new means of execution. There had been a number of bungled or botched executions. And these botched executions were horrible affairs. When you hang somebody, if you don't do it correctly, two things could happen. One is if you didn't drop them far enough, then they would end up strangling to death and that may take 30, 35 minutes. There are actually scenes where friends and relatives have jumped on the person's legs and hanged on them so that they could hasten his death. The other way you could make a mistake is if you dropped him too hard, too long, that could then snap his neck, which it's supposed to do, but also tear off his head. Their report, this 90-page report, which is sort of a world tour of executions, there were five that they finally came to the conclusion were possible. One was the garret, um, which is a metal collar that goes around the neck. Um, they decided that was not acceptable because that smacked too much of the Spanish Inquisition. They considered a firing squad, but they didn't want uh, Americans to associate firearms with execution. They considered the guillotine, but that was considered not appropriate because it was too French and smacked to the French Revolution. So what this is largely about is the way New York and Americans were trying to define themselves and define themselves as technologically advanced. I think that if they were going to consider electrocution as a form of execution of criminals, that the most obvious person to approach in the country would have been Thomas Edison. He was the most noted electrician of the time and, and somebody that I think that uh, they, they would have been likely to turn to in any case. And Edison's immediate response was no. He didn't believe in capital punishment. He didn't want something as beneficial as electricity being used for a negative purpose. But if Edison was losing business to George Westinghouse, 
Edison's own best hope of preserving his own inferior system was to demonstrate that the Westinghouse system was unsafe, and the best way to demonstrate the dangers of a Westinghouse system was to use a Westinghouse system for execution. In June 1888, Thomas Edison, the man who had bewitched his country with the phonograph, gave his considered view to the Death Commission. The most suitable apparatus for the purpose is that class of dynamo-electric machinery which employs intermittent current. The most effective of these are known as alternating machines, manufactured principally in this country by George Westinghouse. When Edison gave out of evidence to the commission, because of his stature, it, it carried a lot of weight with them. And in, it, ultimately, it also carried a lot of weight with the public. Edison was a hero of the time. He was the king of this age of electricity. And the public was, was enamored with him. The state approved the death commission recommendation of electrocution as the new and modern means of death. At Edison's laboratories, experiments began to perfect the science of killing by electricity. At Thomas Edison's laboratories, engineers began to test the killing potential of electricity. They used alternating current to try and discredit Westinghouse's rival system. Presuming that you would have been in the uh, room where the experiments took place, uh, what you would have seen was uh, animals with uh, electrodes placed on them, uh, hooked up to an uh, alternating current generator, uh, the power supply, shocked to death, essentially. Edison wrote to the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals requesting uh, animals to be killed, and the SBCA declined. Um, and then Edison um, empowered some of his men to pay local boys 25 cents apiece to buy cats and dogs. As it turns out, cats were not very usable, whether because of the fur um, or for other physiological reasons, they didn't work as well. There was a lot of evidence that some of the executions didn't go very well, that some of the dogs took a long time to die. There was howling. They would fall exhausted to the floor, but still alive. There was a question about whether the people who lived in the neighborhood, the area, would be pleased to know what was going on. Some of the killings took place at night, just for a bit of secrecy. They did do um, a couple of experiments, I think one on a cow, one on a horse, a larger animal. The importance of the work at the lab was to show that, yes, uh, we can kill a person. If I can kill something as big as a horse, I can certainly kill a person. And so, yes, you can do that with electricity. In 1889, Edison's engineers told the state authorities they had mastered death by electricity. They recommended the use of a chair to restrain the victim. George Westinghouse protested their experiments were part of a commercial war against alternating current. But an inexorable process was moving against him. At the furthest reach of New York State, the chair was to find its first human victim. The upper crust of the city called it the infected district. It has been described as one of the wickedest places in the world, known as far as Singapore and Hong Kong for uh, the wide open lawlessness character of the area. Murders, 
rapes. Uh, it was uh, a place of uh, houses of ill repute, uh, one four block stretch of Canal Street, 78 houses of ill repute and 123 saloons, and that's just the main street. On the rough and brutal Buffalo streets, a 29-year-old called William Kemmler plied his trade. Kemmler was, when he was arrested, what they call a fruit peddler or a huckster. He ran a small business with a fruit cart and a few horses, and he peddled fruits and vegetables on the streets of Buffalo. He had a small four-room apartment or flat uh, when he was living with his paramour, Tilly Ziegler. And uh, he had taken to drinking and staying out late at night, although he was still running his business effectively in the mornings and during the day. But he had a reputation of kind of being a uneducated, loud, uh, kind of boisterous uh, individual who was inclined to drink too much. He was known to fight quite a bit with his common-law wife, Tilly. Life with uh, Tilly was not going well. He was drinking heavily, fighting a great deal with her. The landlady uh, heard screams and noises. Either he accused her of being unfaithful to him, um, or he uh, accused her of getting ready to leave. And they fought, and he eventually um, used a small hand axe to uh, attack her and hit her numerous times in the head. Broke her skull in a number of places. Went to a bar and told people I've killed her and went back with police. Her three-year-old daughter had witnessed the whole murder and um, she told either reporters or police that Papa had killed Mama. By that time, Kemmler was in custody. He had already he'd confessed within half an hour. Uh, he'd gone directly to a bar and said, I killed her, and I'll hang for it. In May 89, Kemmler was sentenced to die at Cayuga County Court, Buffalo. New York State had already passed its electrical execution law, and Edison's engineers were designing the equipment. The state law did not say what kind they needed, but Edison and his friends secured some Westinghouse generators through a backdoor method. Westinghouse refused to sell them uh, the generators, and they tried to get through some Westinghouse dealers, and they couldn't get it. But then they were able to go and get some, some used equipment dealer to get a Westinghouse generator, because they very much wanted to use a Westinghouse generator for the execution. They could have used other people's generators, but they wanted Westinghouse to try to give Westinghouse a bad name. If Westinghouse had had the DC system and Edison had the better AC system, I think it would have been out of character for George Westinghouse to devise an electric chair as negative advertising against his opponent. Westinghouse kept the high road. He, uh, he, he actually wrote quite eloquently in some uh, in, uh, learned journals over acknowledging that high voltage was potentially dangerous in the same way as you know, drinking too much whiskey was dangerous. Kemmler's lawyers launched into a marathon series of appeals. He was the first man to be marked down for death by electricity, and he was becoming a celebrity. The appeal hearings were very big news at the time, nationally and internationally. The international press was very interested in the Kemmler case. The major argument at the appeals was that electrocution violated the cruel and unusual punishment clause of the Eighth Amendment as well as the New York statute, which sounded very much like the Eighth Amendment's cruel and unusual punishment clause. So in other words, Kemmler had to show that electrocution was definitely a cruel and unusual punishment. The electric chair was a very heavy, crude, solid piece of furniture. 
It had a high back and what was called a gallows, a piece of a wooden apparatus above his head through which the, uh, one of the cables extended and uh, to which the head electrode was attached. The equipment had lethality, but still had no official title. Somebody suggested dynamort, electricide, ampermort, things of that sort. And uh, it's kind of interesting that uh, some people, friends of Edison, suggested calling it to be Westinghouse. If you're electrocuted, you're going to be Westinghouse because he didn't like Westinghouse. He didn't like Westinghouse current. He felt it was dangerous, and he thought that's what they should call it. A year after his conviction, Kemmler's lawyers were enmeshed in a second high-profile and costly appeal. Kemmler, the sometime fruit peddler, was represented by the best and most expensive lawyers in the state. George Westinghouse paid for Kemmler's defense. He paid $100,000, which was an immense amount of money at that time. Mostly, of course, to protect himself and the reputation of his alternating current. What was at stake for Westinghouse? What was at stake was a big financial loss for him. If alternating current was used as a method of killing people in the United States, then most likely nobody would ever want to use it in their home. I always think of that as such a strange period in our life. Here we have two people, Thomas Edison and George Westinghouse, who are such pioneers and such important people in the, in the industry. Both of them are, are really uh, immense people. And here they're getting involved in something like the execution of a criminal and fighting over something like that. It almost makes me think like the heroes have a feet of clay, that here these two prominent people with so much more important things to do are getting involved in such a, a ridiculous fight. Kamala had become a pawn in a commercial war by proxy. His lawyers, funded by George Westinghouse, took his case through the county, state, and supreme courts. Kemmler himself waited in Auburn prison. Well, his character changed quite dramatically. He was an uneducated person going in, pretty much a, a scoundrel. And after a year in prison, he learned how to read and write. Uh, during that time period, he uh, be became a, a more civilized person. I think a lot of that also had to do with the fact that he wasn't drinking during that time, too. So he was a, a, in a better state of mind. Some reporters claimed that he had lost his mind and was raving. Others claimed that he was very calm, placid. It's very likely that he was uh, passive, as he had been through much of his, most of his time in Auburn. He'd learned to write his name, and he wrote his name repeatedly, uh, dozens and dozens of times, uh, and gave away these autographs. Kemmler's lawyers ridiculed the technical evidence for the effectiveness of electrocution. The engineer who had supervised the animal experiments endured a grueling three days on the witness stand. Two days later, Thomas Edison himself was called. Edison played a pivotal role at a couple of points. They had a long hearing. The transcript is over 1,400 pages. And in that, Edison testifies uh, that electrocution is quick and painless and that this is the modern way to go. The cross-examination revealed that he really had no idea what the effects of electricity on the human body would be. And the attorney did an excellent job of kind of showing that. But still, he was the man on electricity. And since there wasn't anybody on the physiological effects of electricity on the human body, uh, Edison was able to carry the day. It seems like a relatively easy thing to do, to electrocute somebody. But you have to do that without burning the skin or the flesh. And you have to do it, have just the right amount of electricity go through a person's body to kill him, but not so much so that he'll catch on fire or that his body will be carbonized. 
Uh, consequently, since everyone has a different resistance, and people's resistance can change, it is very difficult to figure out how much electricity will do the job quickly without causing the body to burn or to scar. On the eve of the execution, the chair was given a trial run using a calf. America was to stage the world's first electrical killing, and the world was watching. Electrocution is profoundly American, um, and the reason there is an electric chair and there was an electric chair is because of the American obsession with progress and with America defining itself as a country and a culture which um, identifies itself with progress. The electric chair was a symbol of progress. What happened is that there were 27 witnesses, basically men of science and medicine, who had been invited to witness the execution. And they arrived at the prison sometime around 5 a.m. By this time, there had been four or 500 people had congregated outside. And the people had been issued tickets, but they had difficulty getting through the crowd. Uh, Western Union had set up a telegraph office across the street to send word across the world. Kembla had been executed. So there were reporters out there, uh, curious people, uh, young boys and children on rooftops and climbing trees, uh, all hoping to get some kind of glimpse of what was going to happen. Of course, that's impossible because it was all under, behind closed doors. Uh, in the meantime, the warden went down to uh, Kemmler's uh, cell, which was in the basement. And he basically told uh, William it is time. The death notice was read at 5.50 a.m. on August the 6th, 1890. William Kemmler was one hour away from the chair. at the prison room, you meet the other witnesses, it feels very much like you're arriving at a wake or a funeral. It's almost as if the person was already dead and that we're at the funeral. Nobody takes any pleasure in it. Even the attorney general who's for the death penalty, the warden who's for the death penalty, nobody's taken any pleasure in it. It's kind of very impersonal and it's like this is a job that has to be done. Quite honestly, from the beginning, after he murdered Tilly, he was convinced that he deserved the penalty to the degree of the law. But at the same time, it, it was an unknown style of execution. And uh, maybe the unknown was a little more easier to take than a hanging uh, or something he may have seen in his lifetime. So he had no idea of, the, uh, of what he was in store for. His 
some generators at a building removed from where the executioner was located. And so they had a steam engine which drove these generators, and that's what produced the electricity. For Kemmler's execution, he sat in a chair with the electrode on his head, and then there was an electrode on the base of his spine, and they put the electricity down through the spinal column. You brought the wires from that generator into this uh, control room for the execution chamber. In this room, you then had a what we call a voltmeter, which is a device which will measure how much voltage or electricity you have available to actually do the execution. The unusual thing is that Kemmler seemed to be the only calm person there, and one with the presence of mind. So several times he asked the, uh, the guards to adjust the straps to make sure that they were tight, uh, to adjust the skull cap to make sure that was making a good contact, and that, uh, that he wanted everything to go smoothly, and even asked the warden to just take your time and just do it right. They normally see the arm suddenly gripping the chair. This is due to the spasm. They often see steam coming out of their mouths or their ears and occasionally flames because the heat of the electrocution melts the fat in their faces and it sometimes vaporizes and it sometimes catches fire. His last days were fairly uh, calm, passive, um, placid, but he was, he was also, um, praised quite, a, quite um, frequently in the, in the papers for his manly behavior near the end, that he went to the chair without argument, without uh, demonstration of unmanly uh, emotion, um, his ox-like submission, one of the papers referred to, that he was accepting of his fate. Electricity is an extremely humiliating way of killing people. It's humiliating uh, partly because the person uh, vomits and rules. Their tissues swell up like a Michelin man and may burst. They pass water and defecate, and usually there's a horrible smell. What's the smell? Well, the smell is actually boiling urine, um, boiling feces, and um, burning skin. A pretty unpleasant smell altogether.
minutes after Kemmler died, Dr. Southwick, who was one of the uh, instrumental men instrumental in the invention of the electric chair, said, today we live in a higher civilization. He was pleased. He said, I am one of the happiest men in the state of New York today. And over and over again, there was talk of increasing civilization, a higher civilization, and the word progress appeared repeatedly in the arguments for the electric chair. The uh, warden said, Kemmler is dead. And then somebody in the crowd yelled, he's still breathing. And Spitzka screamed, get the electricity back on. This time they left it on for four minutes until Kemmler's body finally caught fire. And it was at that point that they gave the signal to shut off the electricity. And to the whole room, they were in the same room as he was in, and they were probably 10 to 15 feet away at the most. The whole room was filled with smoke and burning, the smell of burning flesh. And it was just a horrible scene. They didn't have the generator uh, tied down properly, so when they were putting the current through, through Kemmler, they, they were running a generator with some belts, and the belts were coming off of the generator, and a person had to be up there trying to push the belts back on as they're getting the electricity into Kemmler's body. Well, the attorney general actually fainted, uh, ran out of the room holding his stomach, and then he fainted. Uh, most of the other witnesses were terribly shaken up by this because they had, I think, like Kemmler believed, that this was going to be a quick and a painless death. It is usually believed because they want to believe that death is instantaneous. It simply isn't true. The fact is that uh, they die to, due to asphyxia, which takes from tens of seconds to minutes. And that is because the electric current stops them breathing uh, while they can still feel. They came in a half hour later to perform the autopsy. But what they found is that his body was still too hot to move. And therefore they had to wait three hours for him to cool off. And the autopsy showed that most of the skull itself had become carbonized, totally burnt. The brain itself did not seem to be affected, although the blood in that area had turned black, and in the rest of his body it had turned uh, kind of a watery substance. No real attempt was made to learn from the autopsy how to execute people. So it was a kind of a generalized autopsy, and they actually split Kemmler's brain into four sections, and each one of the doctors got a chance to take his brain home. When reports reached him of Kemmler's death, Westinghouse was nauseated. He had lost the battle against electrocution. Of the execution, he said, they would have done better using an ax. The public will lay the blame where it belongs. At Edison's laboratories, reactions were more complex. Edison had varied reactions to the death. At first, he's, he blamed the doctors for not conducting the execution properly, saying had it been properly conducted, that it would have turned out quite differently, which was, in fact, a bit of a concession that it had not been done as according to what he would have expected. He then suggested that the best way, really, of executing somebody is not by conducting electrocution through their skull, but rather by conducting it through water. So he had thought about it enough that he had come up with another electrode setup, um, pots of water. Which turned out to be not at all effective. One time, Edison suggested that they could use handcuffs on the uh, person and then make the electricity go through the handcuffs and you know, kill him. Was that a sign of desperation in a commercial battle? Well, it, it, it was somewhat in that I, I do believe that Edison really believed that. Edison felt that alternating current was dangerous and he felt that uh, it really uh, shouldn't be used. He, he really felt that way, but then in addition to that, it was very important for a system that you, that you try to discredit alternating current as much as you can. In the war between the currents, who won? Well, ultimately it was alternating current that won because uh, 
that's what we have today is alternating current. Uh, and it kind of flushed itself out by 1895 when Niagara Falls opened up. And that was the kind of death knell for direct current. They decided to go with alternating current. Although Edison was losing out already, this was kind of like the final blow. This was major commission putting all their eggs into the alternating current basket. Niagara was an industrial cathedral, a massive endorsement of the powers of Westinghouse's alternating system. It drove electricity and light 25 miles from Niagara into the dark heart of William Kemmler's Buffalo. It was a feat beyond direct current and a final emphatic triumph for Westinghouse. For Edison, the electric chair was a temporary tactic in a commercial battle which his system, direct current, was destined to lose. William Kemmler had been a convenient tool, but his execution cast a long shadow. It was one of the first attempts to kind of use a scientific knowledge and apply it to the science of killing. The other thing, they did a lot of things which make Chem was the first modern execution. It was indoors, deep within the prison. It was routinized in a way that seven or eight people had different jobs to do. And it was extraordinarily impersonal and in some senses is the model for the current execution systems we have today, whether they're lethal injection or not. The history of the electric chair is generally thought to be a kind of an impulse to be humane and to be kind and to produce a quick death. Uh, but I think that the story behind it is really the attempt of one major electric company, Edison, to discredit another major electric company, Westinghouse. And that Kemmler, therefore, and the electric chair it's, um, itself becomes a kind of pawn in a larger game. And that I think it shows us that very often people can use lofty social goals uh, to pursue pecuniary interests. <laughs> 